Testament verses on these things, okay? And these believers were forced to make discernment, to, to use discernment and to use questions of motive and heart to make decisions about what they would do. I think it's kind of a, a blessed thing that each of our families in this church, we probably practice and we probably apply different principles biblically in different ways. If you were to come to my home, there's no doubt that I would, I would uh, do things differently as far as applying biblical principle and I'm fully persuaded of what I do. If I were to come to your home, you would apply different principles to different applications within your home. Which one are right? Both. As we are fully persuaded in our mind, applying biblical principle to our home. It's one of the hardest things for my children to understand that because the Smith family, we don't have any Smith family, do we? Because the Smith family in our, yeah, we do have Smith family. Sorry, but can't say Jones. Uh, because the Bleshema family in our church may choose to do things differently in gray and discernment areas, that, that is not wrong. To explain this to children in, of Romans chapter 14 is hard. The point is that we as believers all have individual responsibility or sole liberty to stand or fall before the Lord in these questions of application. These are not clear things, thou shalt not commit adultery. There's no sole liberty on adultery, okay? These are issues that you must choose to stand and fall before the Lord on. They're matters of conscience before God. Either decision in this passage could be right or wrong based on these things. Now listen to this, okay? These come from other passages we don't have time to go to. On motives of why someone is doing something. You know, that guy who accuses, how dare you eat that meat? Don't you know you're supporting paganism? And that guy says, I have no intention to support paganism. I'm going to offend somebody right now. I, I promise you I will. Uh... How dare you? Hide those Easter eggs. Don't you know you're supporting the God Easter? I have no intention of supporting the God Easter. But, and I didn't, I didn't hide Easter eggs this year, but the point is motive is one of the things. Motive. Some, that, some, you know, some would, this also, this comes a lot, a lot on holiday. These are matters of personal liberty. Another thing is stumbling block. The guy doesn't eat the meat. He, another passage says, don't bring the man over to your house who's offended at eating pagan meat and sitting down at your table if he's offended and serving the T-bone. Don't do that. You're going to offend him. But when you're all alone, bake that baby up. Barbecue that baby. Put a little Worcestershire sauce on it. It's good. All right? These are matters that we should understand. They're individual soul liberty in these kind of areas. Does it make someone to stumble? It's not right if you, another passage says it's not right if you don't feel like it's right. What, what kind of craziness is that? What kind of theology is that? It says that which is not of faith is sin. If your conscience pricks you in an area, even though there is not clear scripture there, you ought not do it. You're violating your own conscience. If it's not of faith or if, it's, if you're not doing it, believing it is right, don't do it. The instruction of Scripture in our verses is to, is to allow believers, though, to choose in these liberty areas based on God being their judge. And that's where we come back to the Christian, or we come back to the individual soul liberty, not some other Christian impressing their application or their views on us or on each other. This is individual soul liberty. And you're not in these areas of liberty in application to impress your views on other people. I'm afraid that some independent fundamental Baptists, us, would be the ones saying, don't you dare eat that meat. You better come to the feast days. We've always done that before. This is individual soul liberty. Each individual has the responsibility and the opportunity to stand before the Lord as their master. Nobody in between. No one in between. What's interesting in this passage, look, look down at the passage. Uh, look at verse number 5 in Romans 14, 5. There is something that must keep you from just saying, well, I'll do whatever I want to do. It's the, it's the last part of verse number 5. It's repeated in other places, I believe in 1 Corinthians. And it says right at the end, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. This is not a person that's saying, don't judge me what I eat. Don't judge me what I go to. This is not the person. This is a person that has waited out biblically. 
and they've become fully persuaded in their own mind what they should do before the Lord. That is what we need to do in our own lives in these areas of liberty and in our family's life. I hope your family is functioning according to the biblical principles that you have weighed out, not just anything goes or what the Whitmer family does. It's individual. At, let every, look at verse 5. I want you to read it with me so we can get this. Let. It starts with let. End of verse number 5. Here we go. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. This is soul liberty. Individual soul liberty. You must be fully persuaded of the application of the word of God to your own life. Your own choices. There's also... This, all, this starts, free will liberty begins in salvation, in salvation. This idea of soul liberty actually begins before uh, you're even saved, that every person is going to answer to the Lord individually. You're not going to answer as a family. You're not going to answer as a country. You're not going to answer as a state. You're not going to answer. You know, we don't think about that because we're Americans. But in the, in, in the 13, the 14, the 1500s, Whole countries in Europe were uh, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. Whatever you believed had to do with where you lived or what your name was or what your heritage was. This is the opposite of soul liberty. The idea of soul liberty begins at salvation. We know from Romans chapter 1 and, and, and Romans chapter 3 that a man cannot come to God by his own will. Why is that true? Because if everyone were given a cho choice, Romans 1 and Romans 3, now stay with me to the end, okay? I'm not preaching hyper-Calvinism. But the fact is that if a man is given a choice to come to God, what does he always do? He, he will always reject. We are as sheep gone astray. Romans 3 says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none to understand. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They're, they're all together become unprofitable. Okay, if you, if you have this Arminian idea, that's what it's called, an Arminian idea, that everyone uh, just can choose God or, 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 or turn away from him no matter what, the, the Bible would condemn you and say that if anyone is giving a, a man on his own, given a choice to believe God, he will always turn away from God. No, God's grace has to break in. God's grace. How many of you remember when you were convicted that you needed to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Raise your hand. Okay, that was God's grace breaking into your life. How's that happen, or why does that happen? I have no idea, and I ain't going there. But I praise the Lord that he saved me and had mercy upon me. Oh, no, no fault of your own, no fault of my own, all of his grace. God must reach out to that man by grace. However, man, from man's perspective, when you see in the Bible, you always see when the gospel is given, man is always given the responsibility of the outcome. I don't know how to rectify these two things, but I'll tell you, man is always told to believe on Jesus or he would be condemned. He's always told to repent. He is always given the responsibility to do it. It's on his shoulders. It is his responsibility if he refuses. I don't understand this window of free will that God offers when he comes to a man and opens up the ability to say yes to Jesus Christ. However, we do know that each unsaved man is commanded to make a free will choice to receive Christ. It is his responsibility before God. It is individual salvation at the white, great white throne judgment. Those who have said yes to Jesus Christ, well, they won't be there. They won't, they won't go to that. Those that have said no to Jesus Christ at the great white throne are going to be turned into the lake of fire eternally. Okay? It, the responsibility to repent and receive was always on their shoulders. It was always their responsibility to receive Christ, individual liberty for salvation. Note the verses. There are verses like this all over the Bible. I could have put a hundred up here. Mark 1.15, the last part, repent ye and believe the gospel. Whose responsibility is it in that verse to repent and believe the gospel? Yell it out. Whose is it? it yeah, me, man, yeah. Acts 16, 31, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Listen, from our side of salvation, when you're given the gospel, you always put it to man to be saved. You always make it his responsibility. You preach it to him that way. You preach it straight to him that way. You say you must repent and believe. And, and he has the ability to repent and believe. God's grace will allow him to do that. I don't understand all of that. But when you're evangelizing, 
you always lay it on the responsibility because in 